Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful once again for the privilege that you've given us to just feast upon your word. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, and, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. <coughs> and we are uh, continuing on in our study in the uh, book of Revelation. We're in chapter 2. And uh, in our last study together, we had uh, reached the 8th verse of the 2nd chapter, Revelation chapter 2 in the area of verse 8. Now, we went through the letter to the church at Ephesus, and I want to quickly go over what I saw there that really almost brought tears to my eyes. I use this uh, Bible app. It's... Uh, it's uh, called Bible Hub. Uh, many of you are familiar with it. The first letter uh, to the church, uh, the church at Ephesus. And I pointed out, and I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in review here, but what I pointed out was how that uh, at least one of the things that I pointed to was the fact that the uh, criticisms uh, contained in the epistle are few. The commendations are many. And it just struck me when I was going through that first letter just how much grace came forth from that uh, in the sense that you could almost... Uh, feel the heart of our Lord that this angel, this messenger at Ephesus had left his first love. And yet despite the fact that he had left his first love, our Lord commended him for many things. And in order for me, at least in my mind, to understand this, correctly and and I'm not saying that my view is correct but it's just something for you to think about in order for me to understand this the way that to try to get the thought that I believe that the Holy Spirit was trying to convey was one it, it was quite a process because I had to, first of all, know what it meant for him to leave his first love. And I had to understand, at least to some extent, what the definition of all of the commendation was that we were seeing. Now, let me try to explain this in a very simple way. Uh, bring it down to a human level or that, uh, you know, given a, a human example uh, in a way that I think that might help sort of clear up the fog here. I believe with all of my heart that there are those out there that, that are in a, a position of being a, an angel, a messenger, a human messenger, a pastor, teacher, elder, something which defines what, the, what a church stands for. And they are, first of all, they hate false apostles. And they have exposed them by the Word of God to be false. They prove them to be liars. And they study hard. They work nearly to the point of exhaustion, if not uh, even in, in some cases... Uh, just utter, I mean, complete exhaustion, and yet they haven't quit. They, they persevere. They continue on. And they hate, just as Jesus does, they hate the Nicolaitans. And however you want to define the Nicolaitans, I, I don't believe it's 
There's not a general agreement as to who these people were, but if you want to look at the Nicolaitans as those who stepped outside the authority of God's Word and preached error, not, not grace, uh, maybe perhaps grace uh, as in the sense of, of licentiousness, well, we're under grace so that we can so we can live however we want. Yet, our Lord Himself says that to this messenger that He has left His first love, and He needed to return, repent, change His mind, and return to a point that place in His mind where He just where He where He began. Uh, he began on the basis of grace, but I believe that by leaving his first love, it wasn't about Christ. It was about law. It was about self. It was about sin. You know, you're, you're preaching to clean up your, your life, your own life. The, the, your, your, your whole message is one in which uh, you, you're trying to clean up the flesh. You're teaching law, not grace. You're, you're preaching self, not Christ. It's all about you. It's man is is, is uh, autonomous. Uh, man is truly sovereign. He overrides the will of the Creator and, and, and God is not truly sovereign and so on and so on and so forth. Okay? That's how I'm looking at the text. And I can't, I could not have described a greater grace if I had sat down and tried to write that myself. Now that's how I'm looking at the first letter. And so we're now going to start into the message to the church in Smyrna. Uh, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, uh, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and, and is alive. So again, we're looking at the sovereignty of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God of very God. He's the first. Nothing was before Him. He created the heavens and the earth, and He is the last. He died. He's alive. He rose from the dead. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the ninth verse, I know, says the text, I know. And the word is oida. It is a, it is, it's not gnosko, experiential knowledge. It's oida, perfect knowledge. I know. He knows perfectly. And, and we can ask, and many do, well, if, if God is in fact sovereign, if He holds these churches in His right hand, and He's the almighty, eternal God, why are these churches not perfect? If He's in control, if He determines the outcome, if, he's, if, he's, if, if his, earth, his will will be done on heaven and in earth, if, if he, he who, be, who hath begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, why are these churches not perfect? Why do we see problems? And the simple, straightforward answer to that question is that they do all stand complete in Christ. We stand complete in Christ. Okay? And we are perfected, that is, made mature. That's not perfected in the flesh where that you no longer sin. We are perfected, we are made mature in Christ, and that through suffering. Through suffering. And it's a hard topic for any Bible teacher, I don't care who you are, to talk about the subject of suffering because no Christian wants to suffer. Nobody wants to suffer. You know, it's uh, I guess even in the if, you, if we take the discussion outside the subject of Christianity, uh, you, we can go around and we can say you know no pain, no gain. You know, if you're working out, doing calisthenics, you know, weightlifting, whatever, and people will believe that, you know. But in the in the Christian context, it's sort of a hot topic among Christians. We know, folks, that we are tested if we're going to be any good. Our God isn't raising up uh, children to be spoiled brats, getting everything they want at the, at the hand of a loving, caring, eternal Father. As though that there is no value in testing and discipline. 
we should all agree on the fact that, that, these, that those things are true. Any of you out there who are parents, you know that that's true. There is no true love expressed for a child who has no discipline. You're not loving your child by not being a, a disciplinarian as a parent. It is not unreasonable that our God would put us to the test. In fact, I think we should eagerly anticipate that and expect failure. Yes, failure. Because our God is our only source of strength. It's when we come to the end of ourselves that we come to trust in Him and not ourselves. I know thy works and tribulation. The word is testing. It's not talking about the seven-year tribulation. Testing. Why does He know it so perfectly? Because He's ordained it. It is part of His plan. I know thy works, perfectly know thy works and tribulation and poverty, poverty and a, um, you know, tons of sermons are preached on this verse that will refer back to the poverty that existed at Smyrna. Smyrna was not a poor city, okay? You know, well, they didn't have enough money to buy food or clothes or, you know, uh, shoes on their feet or whatever the, the case may be. Now, folks, there are a couple of words for, for uh, in the Greek for uh, poor. Uh, you know, the one word that we're the most familiar with is that a person is poor. You know, he only has his, his necessary needs, nothing more, just his basic needs. He's just able to get by, scrape by. He's just able to make it. And so he doesn't even have to pay any income tax. But that is not the word, folks, here. That's not the word. Okay? That is not the word. The word here in the text is abject poverty. He doesn't even have what he needs. Okay? So there's lots of sermons preached on these people as poor and God is asking them to trust him and and those may be good sermons I'm not I'm not critical of those sermons but I don't think it's the hard meaning of the text you and I must realize that outside of Christ it isn't just poverty it's abject poverty we were totally depraved it is not in man's, it's not in him to direct his own steps. There is none righteous. No, not one. I, I believe primarily it is a reference to the fact that in ourselves we have no strength. We have no goodness. The natural man cannot be subject to the law of God. He has not the ability to obey God abject poverty, but from God's standpoint, you're rich. Nothing, not, not, it, not from the standpoint of anything in and of yourself, but in Christ we are rich. We are extremely wealthy in Christ. I know the blasphemy, he says, of them which say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. They claim to be God's people, but they are the assembly of Satan, and they are in the church. It's, it's tempting to read that and go, well, you know, they know these ones that are of the synagogue of Satan, and they're, they're not in the church. They're outside the church. That is not what I'm seeing. They're in the church. They claim to be God's people but they are the assembly of Satan, and they're in the church. We know from 1 Peter it is God's design. It is actually God's design that those who are opposed to the things of Christ will, in fact, be in the church. False prophets shall arise. 
2 Peter chapter 2, there's no doubt. There isn't any doubt. They're always there. The false prophets arrive, and they are, in fact, the synagogue of Satan. What a terrible charge. Fear none of these things. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. There's no doubt in the verse. We'd want it to say, don't be afraid of those things that might happen. It doesn't say that. It says, thou shalt suffer. Okay? All right? You shall. You know, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not here uh, to depress you people. That's not my intention. But you shall suffer. If you are in Christ, you will suffer for His name's sake. Various trials, tribulations, hardships, circumstances, situations in which you have no control. You know, and, and I'm thinking of a, a popular TV preacher who wouldn't want to hear that. But that is the truth. Okay? In light of the prosperity, you know, teaching today. That is the truth. One of the great characteristics of our Lord is fear not peace over and over again we see that if it you know if, if you have the chance and, and want to do a bible study look at the times that you are told throughout god's word don't be afraid now i thought of going through a lot of those verses but i, I thought we'd never get any place if i did that we got our work really cut out for us here and our lord consistently says fear not we're going to see that expression several times in the book of revelation now, there are two primary nuances for the word fear. And they're true in the Greek as, as they are just as true in the Greek as they are in English. We talk about fearing God. Why? You know, because we're afraid that He's going to take us to the woodshed. We're afraid He's going to beat us up or something. No. No. But because we respect Him. The two major nuances in the word are, are fright and respect. And God says, don't be afraid. Don't be frightened. The war, folks, that wages against us is a war that we cannot win. But Christ does. The reason we fear not is not because we're strong, because we're supermen, but because Jesus Christ is our Lord. We don't need to be afraid. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. It's interesting. You know, God never pulls any punches. Not that you might suffer. They are ordained of God. There is no doubt, zero doubt, whatsoever, that what comes into your life is ordained by the sovereign God. He knows the way we take, and when He's tested us, just as, as with Job, we shall come forth as gold. It is He who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So what more would we want? Don't be afraid. In fact, I have arranged it that the devil cast some of you into prison. Okay? Not that he might, mind you, but he will. Now that prison folks it may be a physical prison with bars on the windows and locked doors you know stone concrete walls shackles that sort of thing and i have no objection to that these were literal churches but i'm not sure it isn't more than that i'm not sure that we're not seeing more than that in the text any number of christians over the years they feel as though and maybe perhaps you can relate to this. I know I can. They feel as though they've been locked into a situation in which they have no control over. They don't see any way out. You know, from their standpoint, it's hopeless. And I believe that to be true, you know, from their standpoint. Many of us have gone through a situation, a trial, hardship, where they're there appears to be no way out. And I'm not so sure, folks, that the sense of prison here is not part of the testing more than a 
physical building of cement and, and steel, concrete and steel. God allows Satan to put you in prison. If you want a perfect illustration of that, just read the book of Job. You know, it wasn't Job's fault that his children died, that his goods were disposed, that his wife nagged him, you know, that he became sick, really sick with elephantitis or something like that. It wasn't Job's fault. God put Job there. Did, did he have, did God have the right to do that? I, I'm not going to argue against that and say that he didn't. God had every right to do that. He has every right to do what he wants to with his children. Can I not do with my own as I please, says God? Of course he can. I don't think that was pleasant for Job. And Job even expresses the thought in different words that he's in captivity, a prison that he can't get out of. And it, of course we know that the Lord delivered him. It's going to happen here. I think Satan thought he had Job where he wanted him. And not only that, but to make things worse, he set Job's friends against him to torment him, you know, hour verbally, assault him hour after hour. And that just simply added to the wounds. Job was in a prison. That ye may be tried. And what Job learned is what we learn. It's not us. It's Christ. And Job learned that. He learned it full well that it was God. You shall have tribulation ten days. Now, now I know that there are spiritual uses of numbers in Scripture. But if, you, if you follow this channel, you know that I believe that. Uh, the number seven speaks of completeness. But that doesn't mean that there aren't seven literal there weren't seven literal churches it doesn't mean the number isn't literal and we can dream folks all we want about tribulation 10 days and that's up to you you know i, I pondered over that and I, I looked at the the number 10 in scripture and how it's used and and i'm stupid enough to tell you that it, that it's 10 days I understand we got ten commandments, and uh, a, a tithe is a tenth of our earnings. And the, I understand that the Passover lamb was selected on the, on day ten of the first month, and and, and uh, day ten of the seventh month is a day of, of atonement, which pictures the removal of Satan before the millennial reign of Christ begins, and ten plagues that God sent on Egypt. And we can go on and on and on, folks, with that. But ten is also viewed as a complete and perfect number. Okay, I find it interesting when I come across this. It, why didn't the Lord just say, and you'll you'll be in, uh, uh, you know, you'll be tried, you'll be tested for a number of days or a few days, or or why didn't He say, you know, ten weeks or ten months or what, you know, ten days? I don't have the problem with taking taking that as a literal number any more than I do taking the churches being a literal seven churches, okay? But what I, I'm, I'm hoping that you can wrap your mind around is the fact that we have to we have to look at these as both literal churches in which it could have literally been 10 days. And we have to look at this as, as those churches are now a pile of rubble, okay? And there's application for us here today and we have an amazing God who wrote this book, which, which said 10 days, and 10 is a complete and perfect number. I see it as a complete and perfect period of testing. That's what I see in that. So I don't have any problem taking it as a literal number any more than I do the seven churches. We can do what we want with the number, but there are seven churches. They're going to have tribulation 10 days. And, and, and if you, you think you know what that 10 means, if you have another idea, that's fine. But I believe God is clearly saying that, that their testing is ordained for them for 10 days, or was ordained for them for 10 days.
one of the toughest parts about the book of Revelation is, is that, you know, there are things that we know that are, are literal. There are things that we know that, that are symbolic, that are figurative. But I also believe there's something called figurative literal or, or literal figurative, both, okay? Uh, I, let me give you an example of that. Uh, we're on a ship, and the ship is sinking, and we barely make it to the life raft before the ship sinks. And as the ship's going down, we're off together in the life boat, the lifeboat. And I say to you, I say, well, here we are. Uh, we're all in the same boat together. Well, uh, we are literally in the boat. And uh, that, that we're in the boat together is a, is a, is a matter of figurative speech. So you... There can be both. And so, uh, just wanted to put that out there for you to think about. Now, my, my basic approach to this book, or any scripture, is, uh, has always been to take it literal unless, you know, there's some indication, some other, you know, unless I'm forced to, to, to some other position, you know. So I believe that they're going to have testing for 10 days. He's not going to test them for a hundred days or a thousand days. And be faithful even unto death. Death. Now, death can also be taken as literal or figurative. Okay? There is such a thing called death to self. Okay? Death to self is a very real, dynamic part of the, the, the experience of the New Testament Christian in which... Uh, it's most, I guess, my the best way I could explain it is that we die to self. We die to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. It's where we come to the end of ourselves, where we find no strength in ourselves, and, and we completely, totally, absolutely come to rely and trust in uh, Christ and not ourself. It's death to self. Happy funeral, okay? Happy funeral. I hope you all go through it. And, uh, but believe me, there will be a, that part of it. Death is, is not pretty, okay? Not, neither, it's not in the literal sense, and, and it's certainly not in, even in the figurative sense, the symbolic sense, the, the, in the sense of death to self. It's not fun. It's not comfortable, okay? And so I read this, be faithful even unto death. Be faithful even unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. And there are those who say, you know, well, hey, now if you're not faithful unto death, you won't get the crown of life. There are those who say, you know, if you're not faithful unto death, you won't get there. You know, when, when God has absolutely revealed to us that we are victors in Christ, that He always causes us to triumph, that He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Hear me, folks, okay? Who's going to be given the crown of life? Faithful unto death is not suggesting that some Christians are better than others. Well, there's those that are, they're, they're, they can be faithful unto death, but there's some that, that won't be faithful unto death. Now, you can believe that, okay? And I suppose there may be some cases in which that might be true, but God is faithful. You know, you can say, well, some of them have more strength than others. You know, you know, Christ did, he did a great job for some like Paul and for, you know, Peter, you know, Peter wanting to be crucified upside down and, you know, all the apostles. Uh, you know, all these martyrs, foxes, book of martyrs, you can read, you know, man, these were just, these, these were amazing people. They, they had this, a faith that was exceptionally beyond anything that we could ever experience, of course. You know, you do understand that, right? I mean, you know, because we're not them. And, and you can go on and on and on with that argument, folks. But listen, listen. How, go, how, how good a job did God do with you? Are you complete in Christ? 
Is that only for some who are faithful? You are faithful unto death if you are in Christ because He was faithful unto death. Now, that's the position I'm taking here on that. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And I've got to stop here for a moment, and I've got to remind you of a very important fact as, as it pertains to these letters. All seven of these letters start out addressing an, a messenger. Contained within that letter before we reach the end of the letter you're going to see if you bother to look you're going to see singulars and you're going to see plurals you're going to see you or thou singular you're going to see you plural you all plural that's what you're going to see and when we get down to to the end of the letter every letter all seven letters end with end with he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Not, note, it does not say, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church singular. This particular church, the letter that we're looking at, doesn't say that. All the churches. Okay? All the churches. Look. This is how I'm seeing this. Our Lord Jesus Christ revealed to one of his own, John, Revelation, in which he wrote seven letters to seven literal churches. And these churches, everything that he said to each church, he said to all the rest of the churches. The, ch the letters were shared whether they were there were copies made and they were passed along or whether there was one uh, one letter only and they they passed that along that's up for you to decide but uh, the point I'm trying to make here is a very simple one folks we can't pick and choose as we go through the letters and we can't say it, it is not right it would not be right for me to suggest to you people out there you you dear folks out there it, it would be I would be steering you wrong, I believe, if I said that when we go down through these seven letters, we are to pick and choose what we think applies to us and throw away all the rest. Just as if uh, someone at, at Ephesus was reading the letter to, uh, to Laodicea and said, well, you know, that, don't, that doesn't apply to me, and that doesn't apply to me, but, well, maybe that applies to me, but that doesn't apply to me, and I don't think that we can do that. What I believe is, is that he's writing, God is, it, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, is writing, revealing all of this marvelous truth through letters to seven churches, which started out as literal churches, which have application today, and I believe it's, as I mentioned, uh, what we're primarily looking at is the condition of the church prior to the day of the Lord. The context seems to bear that out. But, but we can't n not include all of church history. Started out with seven literal churches. I believe it started out with the first, at the first Pentecost. The true's application goes back to the church, the first church at Pentecost. Okay. If if they could, if you think about the believers back there at Pentecost, okay, they've been uh, there. The body of Christ has only existed for one week, okay. The seven letters haven't been written yet, but if they were to get a hold of them, go ahead, you know, like jump in a time machine, go ahead to the future, get a hold of the letters, and bring them back to the upper room. I think the applic an application could be made. Are you following what I'm saying? Uh, what I'm the point that I'm really trying to stress here is is that even though we are looking at this second letter, okay, to Smyrna, even though that be the case, and, and we're not looking at Ephesus or we're not looking at Philadelphia or Pergamum or or you know, even though it's to Smyrna. 
when we read here that uh, behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried we have a plural okay we have a plural there God is going to allow the devil to cast not some of them all of them okay into prison listen close now I suppose that you could argue that well this is the church to Smyrna we're in the church of, at Ephesus so we're not going to be God is not going, going to allow Satan to cast any of us into prison because that was written to Smyrna now you could argue that I do not believe that's what the text is saying I do not. And I, I'm not trying to scare people. I'm just, what I'm trying to say here is, is that I have a. Now, now the letter does begin unto the angel singular of the church in Smyrna, right? And I've suggested that that cannot be a holy angel, but a human messenger or the message that the church holds forth. But verse 11 reads, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, plural. That's all the churches. Okay? Now, so we're looking at people going to, to prison. Now, if you take that literal, that's, which I'm not saying that that did not occur, okay, in real time, literal time back there. But I believe it goes beyond that. I think there's a prison application for believers today. That's a lot of people in prison, okay? If we're looking at a literal prison, if you take that literal all the way, that's a lot of people in prison. That means every believer in Christ is going to wind up in prison, okay? Or we can look at that figuratively and we can realize what I believe that the, the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey, and that is that God will allow Satan to test and try us in a place in which we feel we are confined and we can't, that we can't get out of. Are you following what I'm saying? And it applies to every single believer in Christ, without exception. Now that's the position that I'm taking on this. I am seeing seven literal churches being written to where that each letter begins by addressing a single angel, a messenger, who holds forth a message of that church that represents what that church stands for. Seven churches which shared these seven letters with one another, wherein the Spirit of God is speaking unto all seven churches in all seven letters. I, I do believe that they each received their own letter. But I do not believe they each received their own particular revelation from God which had no application to the other six churches. I think what we read in all seven is applicable to every believer. We can't pick and choose what we think applies to us or not. And I read in all seven letters the words, He that hath an ear, let him hear. We know that's only God's people. His sheep hear his voice. What the Spirit saith unto the churches, plural. And, or I should say, yet, each letter begins by addressing the singular messenger of that church. I've got to take note of the personal pronouns. I've got to look at whether these are singular or plural. It does not say some of you are going to be cast into prison. It doesn't say that. Nor do I believe this is saying just, you know, some in Smyrna would be cast into prison. The word some, folks, it, it, you'll find it italicized. Some is not there in the Greek text. You'll see that it was added by the translators. And it is not singular. It is plural. The word you is plural. You all are going to prison. Okay. It says the devil is about to cast you all in prison. It, it is not the angel, the messenger, that is going to be cast in prison unless you want to include him in the you all. 
I guess you, I suppose you could do that. The text says they all are. So either they were all cast into a literal prison, which doesn't seem very likely, or prison here is more than a physical building of stone and steel bars. Are you following what I'm saying? God allows Satan to put you in impossible to get out of situations, just as he did with Job, which result in testing so that you, as Job did, come forth as gold. I believe that to be the thought that the Holy Spirit is conveying here. Not, not, one, not one child of God escapes periods of trial and testing. Not one. Okay? Not one. There never has been one ever. Okay? Who has walked any time with Christ and escaped that wondrous opportunity. To what? To do what? To suffer? Well, if that's if that if you want to stop it there, yes. So, so regardless of the testimony or the message of that church, the message or the testimony of Christ here is to the ears of each of his own, this assembly, and all other seven churches in which they there are those who have ears to hear, and they will suffer, they will suffer. For a purpose. There's a purpose in it. Be thou faithful and unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Many people say that's referring to only those there who were faithful unto death who got the crown of life. No, I, I don't have any problem with that. These were literal churches, but I happen to believe that's every one of God's people. I do not believe Jesus cried, Christ did less than a perfect complete job when he died in your place. Now, you may live carnal, but you're a new creation in, in Christ. I believe all of God's children will receive the crown of life. I'll argue that all day long. I don't believe any of them are going to get a crown of death. Okay? This is a wonderful promise. Be thou faithful. I believe that that faithfulness unto death is vested in Christ and His authority, and that all of us people will receive the crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He's got an ear because God ordained it. Faith cometh by hearing. If they don't hear, they're not as sheep. And folks, I'm not opposed to the missionary efforts. Believe me, I'm not. You know, I, I believe, I agree 100% with what Paul said. I endure all things for the elect's sake. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now the letter was addressed to the messenger, angel, elder, pastor, I don't know, somebody there in the church. Now he says all of these seven letters are addressed to the churches. And you may not like some of the things that you read in these letters. If you don't, well, then just go through them and pick which verses that you want to keep and discard all the rest. You know, as if it's speaking to some other ch other Christian, okay? Folks, I can't do that. Revelation is a tough study. I, I have no doubt that much of this book, because most, most of it is still yet future, that... I have a little doubt that much of it is, is uh, well, it's just not today, it's not clearly understood, and it won't be until these things take place. In the case of fulfilled prophecy, okay, we hardly have any argument. We see the prophecy, we see the fulfillment, and it all makes sense. Most of this book has not yet been fulfilled. Now, now you can come back and argue, you know, uh, well, but to these seven literal churches it is. Yeah, and you're right about that. And I don't have any problem with that. But I also believe this is the condition of the church as it exists before Christ returns to reign. I think they were probably tested for a literal ten days. 
I believe that uh, there is an application there for us in the sense that uh, if we are faithful unto the point of death to self, we will receive a crown of life in the symbolic sense, even in this life, life abundant, okay? That's what I'm seeing, all right? Now, you don't have to agree with me on any of this. I've never asked any of you to agree with me on anything through these verse-by-verse -verse studies. Let me take a moment to tell you how much I love you. I love you with all my heart. I love you truly. I thank you for all of your love, your care for this ministry, your concern and consideration for this ministry, your prayers for the direction of this ministry. We have one of our elders, his wife came down with the virus, the COVID virus. I wish you all to be safe. I'm praying for you constantly. Thank you for all your love, your messages of kindness, and all your support. Until next time, thanks for watching.